This is a production of Cornell University. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to talk to you today. Thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this symposium. It's a really, uh, I think it's a great event and a, and, a, and a worthwhile thing to do. And I do think, and you'll hear my perspective coming forward, that doing things virtually does not mean making them worse, does not mean a pale imitation necessarily, does not mean it's not worth doing if you can't do it in person. I think there's a lot of things that we can do virtually and there's a lot of possibilities for this format. Um, and with that, uh, let's get going. All right, so this has been a very challenging time. There's just no two ways about it. Um, in my family, it's probably been three of the hardest months that we've had as a family. Um, my wife has a full-time job just like me. Her job is more stressful than mine. There's, there's more things riding on it. There's more uh, uh, emergencies. All the things that have happened in the last couple of months have, have directly impacted her in her role. And so she has been super busy. I have small children and they are not that small. They're in school, so they need to be supposedly getting education still, but they're not old enough to be self-motivated to, to do things on their own. So we have, we have struggled. There's just no two ways about it. Um, and this has been the case for pretty much every person and every business uh, almost around the world, it seems like. And so, so this has been a challenging time and uh, we've all had to adapt and figure out ways to, to get by. And if we remember back to, to mid-March, um, it was a scary time when all this started. And these are what I call the stages of COVID for, for our area, for, our, for New York State, for, for Geneva in particular, and the Finger Lakes. Um, and back in March, all of a sudden, every, all the shelves went bare. Everybody was terrified. Uh, we, the supply chains were, were disrupted. Nothing was open. Uh, we couldn't get uh, a lot of the basics that we needed. And so it, it became a time when people were just scrambling to, to figure out, you know, where are the masks? Where is the hand sanitizer? Where are all these things that we, the, the materials that we think we need to, to stay safe? Um, and so in our group, people started to say, well, you can make hand sanitizer uh, from spirits. It's an ethanol product, right? Uh, there are some hand sanitizers are, are ethanol based. And so is this something that, that would be of interest to, to, to work on? And quite frankly, it wasn't to me. Um, I thought it was far-fetched. I thought it was inefficient. I heard that there were people doing it around the country and I thought they were kind of like stunts. Um, I didn't think that this was something that was going to, to really occupy our time or our industry, but uh, it became increasingly clear that Purell was gone as far as people could, could imagine. And this was going to be actually a feasible and possibly necessary alternative for on a very regional basis. And so just like the, the industry that I work with is, is very local and deals with the within 100 square miles, a lot of their sales, this was kind of the same situation for sanitizer. And so we, we started to, to work with distilleries and we found there were some who were going uh, just full bore into this black button distillery in Rochester and Buffalo, like just basically switched over and said, this is what we're going to do. Uh, for the next, for the foreseeable future. Some distilleries decided they were just going to make one batch as, you know, a nice thing to do and they're going to drop it off at the fire department and that was going to be it. And there were people everywhere in between. And it became, soon the statistics came out that of the craft distilleries in the United States, like two thirds to 70% were going to at least make some sanitizer. Constellation did a run uh, of, of sanitizer at their facility. And so it became a, a really big deal. Um, what we quickly noticed about the sanitizer that could be created uh, in, this, in this kind of situation. And of course, New York State using the prison system generated this New York State Clean, which is also an ethanol based product. Um, and so Gavin Sachs in our department started to talk to people at Cuga Medical Center. And they told us, well, that stuff is okay. It's fine, it's functional. It does the trick, but it's not particularly fun to work with. It's basically like rubbing alcohol. And so it's not 
really it's it's hard on our hands it doesn't work in our in our foaming dispensers it doesn't work in our the the kinds of uh in our in our squirt bottles and the ways that we want to use it we've got people in our in our medical centers who are want to use this stuff like 50 times a day and this stuff gets really really hard on their hands and it doesn't and we can't pump it and we can't use it as a gel and uh we can't all those things and so besides that in our in our department besides just helping the distilleries make it we also kicked off a project to see if we could add um, gelling agents and various other uh, ingredients so that we could make a product that was more, uh, that was a little more uh, easy to work with, that was easier to work with, that was, that was easier on hands. Um, that proved to be a much taller task because FDA has very strict guidelines. And so that, that, uh, um, that didn't go as far as fast. That was actually the more advanced project probably and the one that was that you know could have had a greater impact. But uh, we got to have a whole bunch of uh, nine o'clock Zooms on Sunday nights as we were talking about what we were gonna do and how we we're gonna meet this, this demand. And for me, quite frankly, it helped me sleep at night uh, because as in all this uncertainty and fear, this gave me some kind of galvanizing project to, to grab onto. And I think uh, talking with a lot of people, they, you found something, right? You found a mission, a reason to to keep going, a reason to kind of face your fears and and uh, and to to, uh, to to take action. And so this was it for us. Um, and it went further than we ever thought it would. Um, and so we ended up making some guidance for uh, people to to help them navigate some of the regulatory and logistical hurdles when you're when you're producing sanitizer. Our department as a whole came up with a website first, uh, a resource where they just started to bank links that they thought that they vetted and said, this is good information. This is the information straight from the CDC, straight from the FDA, straight from the, the horse's mouth as it were. And they collected all these, uh, these links and, and categorized them. And so this made a great uh, uh, program, but they also decided that a lot of the things, the links that they were just posting were just the direct guidance, the, the full documents that were long, that were dense, that weren't specific. And so lots of people had questions and they cooked up the idea of office hours. And if, this is something I was also kind of skeptical of at first. Are people really gonna show up and ask questions? And it turns out, yes, they, yes, they were and yes, they did. Uh, this was also a way bigger success than uh, we ever anticipated. And one thing was that early on, um, I'm not going to say at all this is, had to do with, this was, this was a really valuable thing, um, but there wasn't a whole lot going on also. Everything was closed. People had lots of time in, in early April and everything like that. And so uh, things like this were just, you know, tons of people turning out because they hadn't figured out how to adjust their schedules yet. And, uh, but this was also, a, you know, a really, really valuable resource. And going to my, uh, earlier comments about how virtual meetings can be a little bit even more uh, engaging or can have advantages over in-person meetings. If you look at this screen right now, Olga Padilla Zekor, Randy Warbo, Martin Weedman, Betsy Bin, those are four people who are in huge demand all across the country, all across the world. You're never going to get them in a room together except for uh, in, you know, really uh, extreme circumstances. But, uh, they can be virtually together for an hour at a time, no matter where they are. And so this was one of the advantages of uh, the, the virtual format. And so people got to ask these people, you know, got to ask questions and it was immensely useful to the industry as they're trying to navigate uh, very basic questions at the beginning. Is this a foodborne pathogen? Do we have to worry about that? What are the, you know, how is this gonna affect how we operate? And so uh, this, it was a, um, it ended up being a wildly successful program. Um, and so as, as we started to pass from kind of uh, March and April and April into May, people started to discuss the idea of eventually we will reopen again. Eventually we will, we will be open for business. Eventually we will interact with our customers. How are we gonna do these things? When, when we start to go back to, can't call it normal. There's nothing close to normal. We all know that we're not anywhere near normal today, but how can we um, 
operate at least functionally? You know, how can we how can we at least come up to a minimum of of beginning to 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 uh, continue our operations? And so on our side, we were asked, we were approached to do uh, some best management practices by Julie Suarez, our keynote speaker this morning. Said we need these these guidelines for uh, for craft beverage industries for tasting rooms. And we said, well, we're not really experts in this. This is not something we're particularly trained in. And we, the Wine Institute was coming out with guidelines and various organizations were all coming out with their own uh, procedures. And we were like, do you really need to hear from us? Um, you know, is this, are we gonna be doing something redundant? Is it gonna be, you know, not really helping? Is it, and uh, is it gonna be not, you know, not something that's actually needed at this point? But then we spoke with Sam Filler, who is the president of the, the, who is the executive director of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. And he said, people wanna hear this from Cornell. People wanna hear this, uh, that, you know, with the level-headedness and the research backing that they expect from Cornell Extension. And we think that no matter what the California Wine Institute does or who they paid to do that study, um, we think that your, you know, what you say will have as much or more weight when it comes to talking to the state authorities and when it comes to reassuring customers. And that was a really gratifying thing to hear. And we said, okay, when you put it like that, sure, we're in, we will do our best. Um, and so we uh, started to uh, generate this, this document and we worked on this and eventually it became this webinar, uh, swirl, sip, don't spit, tasting behind the mask. Um, and we got like 470 registrations, which man, I would love to get that many registrations for the things we actually do every day, the, how to, how to manage sulfur dioxide, how to, uh, you know, do all the things that, that usually we talk about. Um, but, uh, it was, it was still good to see this kind of engagement and people were, were dying to hear the right information there. Well, and I won't say that our information was all correct. It was all the best information. They were, they were just, they wanted to hear uh, informed opinions. Uh, and that was, that was what we could provide for them. And uh, we did another webinar with Virginia Tech, with Beth Chang, uh, who is a Cornell graduate student uh, in uh, Gavin Sachs lab, who now works at Virginia Tech. Uh, um, so we did a, a joint webinar on how to actually do back of house operations, how to do winery operations behind the scenes, not the tasting room part, but the actual operations part. And that was also very well attended. Uh, building on the, the success of the, of the office hours for the general food industry, I worked with uh, Greg Peck and our hard cider uh, program work team. And we did virtual office hours for cider, uh, for apple growers and cider producers. And um, it was also, you know, it was, it was really an interesting thing. And it was this the first, uh, as an extension person, office hours were something I never would have thought of before this, before this period. It always seemed like if you're gonna engage with your industry, you better have something clear to tell them. Uh, you better have a message, you know, you better have a, uh, a set program, an agenda. And I think that we in extension sometimes overestimate are how interested people are in hearing uh, a topic and we underestimate how much people just want to get together and catch up and talk and share stories and so this was an opportunity to do that we had no real set agenda no set program and people just wanted to to connect and this was something of course in this time connection has been hard to come by and there's been a lot of enforced solitude, right? So the idea that people could just get together um, and, and kind of share experiences, that was uh, something that, you know, as I keep saying, all this stuff, all the things that we did at, when we were first presented with them or when I first heard it, I said, I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, and it shows that I know nothing uh, about what's gonna be a good idea or not, or not because these things were all uh, turned out to be great ideas and we're so glad that we did them and so glad that we had opportunity to engage with industry like this. Um, and all along while we were doing this, the Cornell Cooperative Extension System in the regions or the specialists were all cranking out similar things. 
it was really, really gratifying and impressive to just to be a part of this group, to be on this team, to see what Julie Suarez had organized. She was running a call every week for people who were everything from, you know, equine to ornamentals to uh, business operations to labor to special uh, areas like, you know, where, where I am in, in craft beverages uh, and coordinating responses and saying, hey, this group did this. What if we had, you know, what if we took that model and, and applied it to this commodity or to this area of the state? And it was, and everybody was just jumping up and saying, how can I help? What can I do? You know, here's what we've done. Send it along. Um, it's just, it was, it's a very, I mean, it's, it was, I don't know how to, to put into words how gratifying it was to see, to be a part of this group that, that really just wanted to do whatever they could to help uh, throughout this process and was working so hard to make sure that New York State farmers, New York State producers, New York State residents were being able to, you know, were getting the best information they could, the most timely information they could uh, to, to be safe and to keep doing what they needed to do to keep the food supply uh, uh, moving. So after, you know, we reach late May, early June, and we have some modicum of normalcy, and we start to look back and see uh, that maybe we can start to do the things that we had planned to do this year before the world changed so drastically. We start to look at, well, we had planned this workshop. We had planned this seminar. Uh, we had planned this this trial, how are we gonna do that now uh, in this new world? We're not gonna uh, get people back together um, like they were before. We're not gonna have a workshop next week where everybody comes and sits together. Uh, that, that's not gonna happen, so, so what can we do? We have a couple workshops that we've set up this summer and uh, the one workshop is a cider workshop where I work with the Cider Institute of North America. It's a group of instructors that, that collaborate to, to come up with uh, workshops and uh, research and education for, for the cider industry. And the other one is EnoCert, which is a course that, that uh, we just do in our in-house in Agritech with our, uh, our analogy lab, our craft beverage institute. And so I had workshops scheduled for both of these. And the cider workshop, we went with in one direction. And that is, it used to be a week long workshop where everybody came you know, for an entire week and we pulled that completely apart. And now it's gonna be over 15 weeks where you'll get some videos launched on Monday and on Thursday nights for a couple hours, you'll get together with your class, you'll have a guest speaker and you'll meet uh, in, in person, quote, on Zoom for a couple hours. And so that's gonna be, it's completely deconstructed. It's gonna go over 15 weeks. Uh, for EnoCert, we decided we're gonna keep the, what we call the synchronous component of it. We're gonna have it, you know, it was scheduled for a couple of days in August. We're still gonna run it over a couple of days in August. We're not gonna have, um, we're not gonna pull it apart like this one where it's gonna be weeks and weeks or just a couple hours a week. We're gonna try to just run it uh, in a condensed version um, over that period of time. And so we'll see which model works. I've, we've heard people, when you do it one way, people say we'd like it the other and vice versa. But I think there are advantages to both. Um, the one advantage to the, to the really deconstructed one is that you know, if, it's, if I have to give a presentation of week seven, I now need to record videos for and prepare different kind of resources than I would if I was doing it in person. I have till you know, at least week six and a half right, to get that done. So that's, that was one of our motivations, I'll be very honest. But uh, the other advantage is that, I mean, well, we'll talk more about the advantages that I see for both of these courses, but uh, it does give us a lot of schedule flexibility to bring in uh, our, our guest speakers and other resources. You know, what can't we do in a, uh, 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 in this kind of a environment? We can't have people sit in a classroom for six hours together. We know that's probably the worst thing we can do, right? Is to get people in one enclosed space for a long period of time. Um, so we won't be doing that. And when you've got people who, who are staying remote, you can't go in the lab, right? You can't have them come in and 
practice titrations, practice looking at a, a spectrophotometer, all those kind of things, a microscope. We're not going to be doing those things. So that's that's what we lose out on. Um, we can't have tastings, right? Uh, we can't have people sit together in a room and spit. That's that's not that's also very dangerous. So these are things we're going to not be able to do as as well. Um, but what can we do? Um, as I said, we can change the hours. We can we can be much more flexible for you know as long as it works with our audience. We can have things early in the morning, late at night. We can have condense them into a couple hours. Um, there's there's lots of options there. Uh, we don't have to have people travel and then leave and then come back or whatever like that. Uh, we can bring in more speakers. Our cider course, we're going to have a guest speaker almost every week. Uh, we don't usually have 10, 12 guest speakers in a you know, week-long workshop, and we don't have guest speakers from California and from Washington and from Virginia and from Canada, um, and we can do that now. We have that possibility. We can have lots of people. We can go virtually tour their facilities too. We can, we can shoot video for one of our office hours. You know, Greg Peck was out in the, the research orchard and he could show people, this is our trellising system. This is this kind of a tree. You know, all the, this is the rootstock. Um, and we probably could have done that before, obviously, but it's things we didn't really think about out, you know, honestly as much. So uh, those possibilities are being open to us and we can bring in we can go visit wineries, cideries, laboratories. We can we can shoot video of a titration, all those kind of things. Um, so there are some options for us, and it's 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 been a little bit refreshing to think about what you can, what an online course, what an online seminar, what it can look like. Uh, it, it won't look the same, but it doesn't mean it's worse. Uh, I think there are some options. We're going to send people uh, samples to taste for the cider workshop, so we're going to mail them some ciders. They're all going to get the same ones. We'll taste them together. Uh, it won't be that different on the screen because we can talk about what people are smelling and tasting. Um, so as long as they've got the same product, it shouldn't be that uh, that much worse. So we're going to get around it and we're going to see how this all works. And I think there are some of these things, as people keep saying, some of these practices will be adopted when it's not the only choice. When we actually could hold some of these sessions in person, there may be some that we choose not to because we like the flexibility or the format uh, of the remote option. Uh, what have I learned throughout this process? There are a few things. The first is that uh, in extension, I never thought about timeliness in quite the same way. Uh, it obviously was kind of a different, this has been a different situation. Most of what we do is applicable, if not all the time, then seasonally. And so I don't think we ever felt the same push uh, or impulse to, to really jump into a specific topic because that was hot this week. But um, in this, I have seen up and close and personal what happens when everybody's talking about it and you decide to put out a, a program on it. Holy cow, do people engage uh, when, you know, in that kind of a situation. I hope I never have to do this kind of thing again, um, but it is a lesson in if you can find what, what, what's on everybody's mind and, and present on it, it doesn't have to be the best, it doesn't have to be the uh, perfect, um, but it, it will be, get people interested. Uh, people really respect Cornell. I think it was gratifying to see that in this sea of news and opinions and politics and uh, governments and all these kind of things, people have different levels of trust for all those, but. Uh, I think people on all sides of the, or on most sides of the spectrum, uh, how many sides of the spectrum have, um, came and, and really wanted to hear what we had to say and felt like we were unbiased, you know, which is a very, you know, nobody feels that way about any TV network, right? Nobody feels that way about any politician. So the fact that we were, that we were seen as a relatively unbiased uh, and, and trustworthy resource, that was, that was gratifying. And as I said before, wow, just like the people who work here are, are really impressive uh, and what they did and how they stepped up. I was, you know, I, uh, I was just, it was, it was amazing to see these people uh, who were so engaged and so committed to, to what they were doing. And um, it's unfortunate that you always see kind of the, you know, you have people have to be tested in this way or, we have to be put in this situation to, to see you know, people's true colors, but uh, 
this is quite an organization and uh i was i was just very proud to be a part of it um so with that um these are just uh the basic resources which i'm sure you've seen among all the other things but that's the institute for food safety's covid resources is a great web page and continues to be um and then the the eden is the emergency uh, network that is part of Cornell Crop Extension, and that's where they have housed their resources. And um, yeah, so you can look at those if you want. Uh, I don't know if I have, I believe I have a little time for questions, and I think I saw one on the chat. Is that true? Yeah, you have about four minutes for questions, and there are two on the chat. Okay. And the first one is from Carly Regan. Uh, what lessons from these COVID events and learning formats do you plan to move forward with as you resume some sort of your previous extension responsibilities and foci? Okay. Um, you know, I think that going forward, um, I think video is something that, you know, we were all talking about video before and, you know, my kids, right? Everyone wants to watch YouTube videos of everything. That's, that's all they need. They don't need TV anymore. They don't need anything. They just need YouTube. Um, and, but I think the, the possibilities for, for video are something that we will, that we will take with us. Um, and I think the ability to, to remotely connect, uh, guest speakers, you know, the fact that we can have people from France and from, uh, Australia and from South Africa and from, uh, the Southern hemisphere, uh, come and talk, you know, remotely. And I think. We, we kind of knew that before also, but it was something that was always viewed as kind of a pale imitation. But I think now that everybody, uh, our constituents have all used Zoom so much, they see that uh, it can work. So I think that's something we'll adapt. Um, and I think, I think there'll be a lot of hybrid courses going forward. I think what's we're gonna see both on campus and an extension where you'll do a lot of lectures remotely and then maybe you'll come to campus to do your lab work you know to do some kind of a, a hands-on section but it won't you won't spend as much time maybe sitting and looking at powerpoint slides in a classroom now that everyone realizes you can look at those powerpoint slides uh on zoom or on some other format so i'd say that those are some of the things and i think just also trying to be more trying to really think about being in the moment a little bit more and trying to, to be a little bit faster. I think we, we often try to get things to be perfect. Um, and instead we should try to get things maybe more to be more timely. I think we might uh, turn in that direction as well. Um, so, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my question was similar. Um, are there any permanent changes that you may make to your program post COVID? It seems like you answered that before, but if there's anything else you wanna add, go yeah, ahead. Um, that's, I, I'd say those are, you know, yeah, those are my, those are my thoughts. Uh, I think more of this will become apparent as we, as we start to, I think that when we really uh, can go back uh, to the, to the, to the classroom, and then, then we'll have the real example of, then we can really sit down and say, what do we miss about the remote? What was, what were the parts of that that we, that were actually, were better? Uh, or what parts are we really enjoying? I think when we, when we can do both of those things, we'll have a better idea of, what we want to uh what we really want to adopt permanently but and i think that will be always in flux but i think that i think that the remote uh the remote presentation is here to stay you know for long island the long island wine region that's an eight hour drive if you get any kind of traffic i think that they're going to be much more receptive to this kind of thing uh and so forth so yeah yeah we had one uh question by chase as well um, so Cornell CCE is clearly up to the challenge of the COVID crisis. Do you feel like other states with different extension frameworks are equally successful? Is there anything unique about the U New York extension system that shines during COVID? Um, I guess first and foremost, I don't know for sure. I haven't, that's something I should probably look into is seeing how the other states were responding. Um, they, you know, every state has had a kind of a different experience of this. Some of the states are experiencing what we experienced in April now, right, or are about to experience it. So it'll be interesting to see how they respond. They're going to have some of a head start based on what, seeing what other states have done. Our, our cooperative extension system with 
you know, maybe one or two exceptions nationally, uh, and maybe not even, is the most intact still. We have the most people uh, still working. You know, a lot of the extension systems have been very, very condensed due to budget cuts over the years. And so the fact that ours is still as intact as it is, um, is a huge advantage. And I think that that showed through in this, in this system, the, the, the scale, the breadth of it, the amount of people, the amount of really good people we have uh, and resources. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely not too much, uh, but it was, uh, it was, I think that the, the fact that we have experts in all these areas working still, um, that was something that was uh, a real uh, asset for, our, and, and I think that that's, that was what helped us to, to do what we could do. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.